Hey there, and welcome to the daily podcast where wisdom smacks us with kisses or love taps. I'm Michelle Spiva, a wisdom strengthening coach, your host, and practical priestess of wisdom. Join us daily to gain wisdom and mental strength as we tackle innovative thinking, address emotional and behavioral life traps, and yes, provide you with some practical how-tos to wrap it all up. So settle in or crank up the speed 2x, whatever gets your mental processes firing as we dive in. Stay tuned. Hey there, this is Michelle Spivey, your Practical Priestess of Wisdom with today's podcast of Wisdom Smack. Join me on the flip because y'all, it's time. Oh yes, it's time to catch a ride, build a boat or do whatever because it's time for us to get on up and get going as we learn how to escape from the land of apathy. You see, when you get a little too comfortable, a little too set in your ways, you have to know that there is a boogeyman out there called the case of the blahs and too many of us have been able to not have to really do that much every day. So I'm just here to tell you it's time. So join me on the flip as you did, we discover two things that you need to be aware of to help you get out of any case of apathy. I'll see you on the flip. Hey there, this is Michelle. Let's go on and get into it. So today we are talking about escaping from the land of apathy. And when we're talking about apathy, we're talking about a big old case of the blahs. We're talking about that part that makes us numb. That's where we get apathetic from, idle, if you will. Uh, A few times, On this podcast, I have mentioned a book by uh, Napoleon Hill called Unwitting, Outwitting the Devil, where that's the major premise of the book is that he has this fictitious uh, conversation with the devil and the devil talks about being able to capture a soul based on the fact that a lot of people fall into idleness and apathy where you just can't care you you just have a you know a meh and the reason why we're talking about the land of empathy uh, excuse me of apathy not empathy apathy is because it is pervasive and we had up until recently had a culture that made it somewhat okay and even cool to be in apathy statements like i have no more the word rhymes with tr- uh, fire truck. I have no more fire trucks to give <laughs> was, whether we realize it or not, a nod towards apathy in some cases. Or we had other times when people would be like, you know, miss me with that uh, or miss me with whatever it is. And the miss me part was bypass me. Then we had Joe Low instead of FOMO, fear of missing out. Joe Low became a big one where it was the joy of missing out. And it was kind of a bypass around us where you're like, you go ahead. I'm cool over here doing nothing. <laughs> and there are a lot of laws, both um, natural and spiritual that are in effect when we find ourselves in this case of apathy. So before we get into what I want to talk to you about, about how to get out of this, why to get out of this, and um, what will help hopefully to spark your inspiration to gather up the strength, I want to go with the why. And the why is because as I am doing the work every day to uh, really embrace wisdom, really concentrate on working on strengthening my mind uh, to be able to live the life 
that I desire, I have been practicing what I preach. And I've been looking at looking for and at the patterns. I've been seeking to see what wisdom would show. And wisdom is showing that many of us around the world are not ready for what is required to go into the new dispensation of life as we know it. And that is why a lot of the different types of uh, episodes that we've been having recently is for the preparation of getting us ready. And if you guys have been rocking with me, you'll notice that we've been talking about things like getting over mental fog. We've been talking about how to move from the mediocre. Now, mediocre and apathy are different because mediocre is you're doing something, but it's just not hitting on much. Whereas apathy is you don't really even want to do anything. So we've talked about moving from mediocrity into the masterfulness of life. We've talked about the secrets of lazy people's success, where we have talked about how people who a lot of society considers lazy are actually uh, innovative geniuses. And they uh, work to protect that energy that they need when it comes to doing what they want to do and that what they passionately desire to do as opposed to what everybody else thinks they should do. Then, of course, we talked about overcoming mental fog. Now, I want to say it. Y'all have really been loving these uh, podcasts. The listens are up. So there is something in the air and wisdom is on to something. So when we talked about that overcoming mental fog and dullness, this is so that you could start firing up that great engine, which is our brain. We even talked about reconnecting and um, strengthening mental synapses so that we could fire on all pistons to be able to wake ourselves back up. And then because of that, the next day we talked about dopamine and how uh, too much dopamine from the wrong source erodes our ability to focus. And I'm going to tell you guys, it's been hard to focus. I have a lot of different things that would try to take my attention. And they're not just a phone or something frivolous. No, they are important things and such that I've been having to find that I'm, I'm needing to up my priority game. And if wisdom leads me, I'll talk about the new types of priority that are needed. But today, uh, oh, and yesterday, I'm sorry. <laughs> yesterday, we talked about how to stop being programmed uh, unawares. We talked about communication um programming, communicative programming, and how insidious and covert it is to help you to understand. We talked about the three types of words to be on the lookout. We talked about how looking for words that are emotive or, or, or have feeling, words that are active, and words that are around some type of time or immediacy or going to depending on how they're put together, they create very strong embedded patterns or what we call weasel patterns. So we talked about that. And so today, mm -hmm, today it is finally time for us to talk about how to escape out of the land of apathy, where there is no more a little folding of the hands, a little laying down of the head to slumber. No, it is time to wake thyself and to get going. Uh, because there is much to do. And um, our next, I, I'm not going to tell y'all everything that's in this series, but I, I know what's coming next. And trust me, you want to pay attention to today because being able to understand what is really going on and what type of part of the war this battle is will help you to not become a bystander for what happens next uh, all around you. You want to be able to get back into the game. You want to be able to get back into the fight, be in the room where it happens, if, if you will, and all of that. Okay. So thank y'all for letting me set that part up. So talking about apathy, as I said before, apathy is a release, if you will, uh, to do nothing. Now, originally, Apathy uh, came from around the 1500s and uh, not came from, but it was first noted around the 1500s. And apathy is actually one of those words that started out with a good rap, but it didn't keep it up because back then apathy 
was it meant a freedom from suffering. But then it started to evolve uh, where the French got it. And they were like, it's not just a freedom from suffering. It's a passionless existence. Now, to me, that's torture. So, yeah, you you didn't suffer, but you had nothing to live for either because it's now a passionless existence. And so we continue to see this evolve when it moves itself through Latin and Greek and all of this. And it, it, it moves from freedom from suffering all the way through to a want for sensation without feeling. Uh, it, it means, and if we go back and look at the Greek, uh, it means without emotion. Okay. And so it was a divorce, if you will, from emotion, feeling, and suffering. It's part of where they say, be careful what you wish for. You just might get it. And nobody likes to suffer. Suffering is hard. It is not fun at all. But you have to be careful because you could end up in a state of apathy. And so many of us got on the bandwagon and journeyed to the land of apathy where nothing faced you. And you were like, miss me with the bull. You were like, um, I don't have any more fire trucks to give. And thus, you wake up and lo and behold, you're numb. There is no attachment to emotion or senses to the point where things that should have you running and doing and and uh, taking advantage of or avoiding look just like every other thing. There are no highs and lows. And people don't realize how painful numbness is. Have you ever had a limb lose circulation and it gets those little numb tinglings where you can't exactly feel normal sensation, but try to stand up or use it? And boy, you feel it. And I've always pondered, why is it that numbness hurts so badly? Well, part of it is because we are made and wired to be fully engrossed. Um, Even the Buddhists talk about in this life, you're going to have suffering and your quest is to learn how to supersede that suffering while still being able to stay attached to your emotions. Okay, so. Thank you guys for letting me, you know, talk a little bit about that because it's really important because the next evolution of apathy, it started moving. So right now, uh, you know, in the 1500s it, and into the 1600s, it, it's evolved from freedom from suffering all the way into a sense of uh, emotionalist existence, it, 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 unable or without feeling. Zombies, anyone? Can anyone see how popular and the reason why zombies became so popular in our um, in our zeitgeist, in, in our uh, culture? Yeah, without feelings. And lo and behold, a couple of hundred years later, this thing just kept on evolving. And it evolved into an indolence of the mind or an indifference to what should excite. That one was noted around 1733. So now you have not only moved from being uh, free from suffering to a passionless existence, to being severed from your ability to feel and have emotions, to now you have a a laziness of the mind, an indolence of the mind, and an indifference to what should excite only 230 something years later. So now today we find that apathy is continuing to spread its wings. It's like urban sprawl. It just does not know how to obey boundaries because now it's a general understanding that apathy is, it means the absence or the suppression of passion, emotion, and excitement. Okay. It's also a lack of interest in or a concern for things that others find moving and exciting. So now, not only have you done all the stuff we just talked about, but now apathy is causing you to sequester yourself away from society, away from your peers, to where now things that move them don't move you. And can you see that this thing is kind of like 
the Dementors from Harry Potter or um, the dark, the deep, if you will, that shrouding uh, presence that would steal away your ability to live and have excitement. This thing is insidious because, yes, you don't feel um, suffering, but you don't feel much of anything else. And thus you lose your connection to be able to interact with other people. And we are made to be social beings. So now that we've talked about this whole mental numbness and how we got into this land of apathy for some of us, it's time to get out of it. So what I want to talk about here is, is looking at your days in your life uh, with a new measuring stick, looking at things as, and I like to put it as a penalty or a prize. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Maybe I'll do an entire podcast on it, but we are all given the same grace or mercy each morning by the benevolent whatever that wakes us up or by the battery that runs our body. However you want to look at it, I don't, I don't, it doesn't matter to me any, but we wake up with the ability to breathe. We wake up hopefully with the ability to think straight or as the old deacons in the church when I was a kid would say, woke up clothed in my right mind. I've never figured out how you could be clothed in your right mind, but hey, it works. And so being able to have that, I want you to look at reframing where you are with the same tools that you had yesterday, but just being able to reframe them where you're now able to say, okay, with the resources that I've been granted today, am I going to use them as a prize or are they going to become a penalty? I saw a book, I haven't read it yet, but I saw a book uh, advertised where this guy uh, knew the exact date and time of his death and he created a spreadsheet where it ticked off his seconds of every day until the time of the certain time of his death. And like I said, I have not read the book yet, but I imagine him looking at different segments of his life, possibly by hours or even days or weeks, where he is looking to see, did I use this allotment of time as a prize or was I penalized for my misuse of it? And by simply reframing what we have been given, meaning breath, health, hopefully, the ability to use our senses, uh, the ability to uh, reason and grow and learn and do, it is, like I said, every day it's a brand new mercy and grace. And so by reframing, is today going to be a prize where I am able to gain something that is the desire of my heart that makes me feel well and great and gives me a boon for having experience today? Or am I going to allow myself to let go of the reins and give in to apathy where it becomes a penalty that I can never get back, a setback, a handicap, if you will? And there's something about apathy That's insidious. And so I want to talk about some of the byproducts of being in apathy for too long, being idle for too long. Uh, Of course, there is that saying that an idle mind is the devil's workshop. But I I don't want to go so cliche as today. I want you, if you will, to permit me to talk to you about two concepts. You've probably already heard of them and you already know them. But today I want to just give a little wisdom smack on the side effects of, of apathy, of being too comfortable in the land where you've set up residence and a stone home in the land of apathy. And that is the byproducts, the side effects, the offcast are atrophy and entropy. So don't glaze over, stick with me. I'm going to make it make sense. All right. So atrophy, atrophy, we all know what it is. It's that shriveling up. It's that general senses of use it or lose it. When you are apathetic for too long, you lose the grace, the mercy, the prize that you've been granted. We see it all the time. Stop exercising for a month. 
especially if you're over the age of, of 30 and see how fast your body starts to move into intra, intra, I mean, excuse me, atrophy. Have your hand in a cast for six, six to eight weeks. And when you take that cast off, see how much weaker that arm is than the arm that you still use on a regular basis. Over and over again, we can see that there are true, real penalties. So when I'm asking you to reframe, to look at your days and the resources you've been given in that day, in that hour, in that second, in that moment, as either a penalty or a prize, there really is a penalty at stake. And so the official, if you will, the official understanding of atrophy is this. In uh, uh, physiological terms, it means that it is the process of reabsorption and breakdown of tissues. So if you don't use them, the body says this is energy and mass and matter that we can reabsorb to go and put it into something else. Think about Unfortunately, when people uh, have amputations or they not amputations, but or when they they become um, paralyzed and they're not able to use their legs for a while, what starts to happen to the leg part that is not used? That's a, an example of the physiological process of, atro- uh, of atrophy. And think about it. Atrophy is really either a partial or a complete. And this is the thing that I don't like. That's why I want you out of this land. I don't care if you got to hitch a ride on the uh, the back of a moth. <laughs> Do whatever you can to get yourself out of that. Because atrophy is a partial or a complete wasting away of a part of the body. And this is not just for the limbs and extremities that you can see. Your mind can atrophy. And that's what's insidious about apathy. Apathy for too long starts to have your mind atrophy, all right? I'm hoping that you see this. And not only is there a wasting away, sometimes, depending on what the body wants to use the unused stuff for, it can include mutations. Yes, mutations. You can actually become a freaking zombie. You can become a mutation of yourself. And these mutations can destroy the gene and um, it, they can build up something that is from nature, but out of nature. Remember, we talked about preternatural um, can do some really weird stuff. Now, when we're talking about atrophy in the in the common sense, some of the contributors of how this process happens are things like poor nourishment, um, poor circulations. Like you don't move, you lose it. Uh, Loss of even hormonal support. And we talked about that yesterday. Dopamine, uh, epinephrine, norepinephrine, um, uh, all of these uh, different uh, things, serotonin, those are hormonal support for you to not be cuckoo. Okay. Um, Loss of nerve supply. Yes. You get disuse where you can't use it anymore. So this is really serious. And that's why I am trying to hopefully get you on this journey to get ready for what's about to happen. Because we're going to move, it's going to seem like we're moving from nothing to a thousand miles an hour. You heard it here. So I need y'all to be ready and take this seriously. All right. So I think you get the understanding of atrophy, of what happens. So apathy works on your brain and it's so, it always so slick where you don't even realize that your brain is atrophying, where all you can do is be a slobbering idiot if you stay in this land of apathy. All right. I'm not trying to scare you, but I need you to know. So let's talk about entropy. Now, entropy, if when you go and look at entropy, it can be really scary because (laughs) it starts to talk about the second or third laws of thermodynamics and all of that. But let me just cut to the chase. Entropy. uh, In the 19th century, there was uh, this this um, uh, German scientist and uh, physicist, excuse me, and uh, Ralph Clausius was his name. And he worked on thermodynamics when thermal meaning heat and dynamic meaning movement. And so he looked at what was called a turning point. And a turning point for him was when there was a transformation where think of it as 
you are going at a certain level and then you continue to speed up and speed up and speed up until that point where if you go another further, yeah, that's my word. If you go another further, <laughs> it's going, you're going to start to disintegrate. Um, the the pistons are going to rattle loose in the vehicle. Um, the G-forces are going to split the atoms of the body into pieces. That's where he was talking about with entropy. And you might be saying, well, Michelle, what does this have to do with uh, apathy? Glad you asked. What ends up happening is, is if you continue to go in any direction, you will meet resistance. And entropy is, it, it basically comes down to a decline or a degeneration. So when we talked about earlier, we were talking about um, order and disorder, chaos, and I talked about the pendulum swings and how the pendulum will stop going to one side and then it will need to go back to another. That is a classic and very simple example of entropy. And so with apathy, you really need to realize that if you are not ready for when the pendulum swings back, and you have allowed apathy to go too far and you've started to atrophy, when entropy starts to happen, you will be lost. It, it will not bode well for you. Uh, you see it all the time and don't realize when people are like, I can't be here anymore. That life is too hard. I'm not trying to paint with broad strokes on that, but I'm just uh, trying to give just a few of the examples that of possibilities that can happen. And I'm not pronouncing this on anybody who feels this way. I am saying that this might be a contributing factor. So I've picked out a few instances where you can see how entropy can happen. So think about uh, when you have a, a group of people and you line them up, you line them up 10 deep, you whisper a secret in the first person's ear, and then you tell them to whisper into the next person's ear. And then you run down to the 10th person and you ask them to tell you what you said when you told the first person. This is an example of entropy. We are always going through new iterations. And so it's kind of like we're trying to outrun the racehorse. So when you're looking at these byproducts of what at apathy does, apathy takes away your ability to, to have a keen ear to continue to hear and get the same message. Uh, the fancy way of saying this is, is in data transmission, uh, transmission uh, and uh, information theory. <laughs> let me stop doing that. That means that the message that there is a loss of quality or, or information in a message as it is transmitted or signaled. So no matter what, even if you're using um, telephone data, uh, digital data, or whatever, there's always going to be a loss of the integrity of the original information. And so entropy is always hounding us. So when you find that you're in atrophy, it's a warning sign that you won't survive the natural inbuilt loss of entropy. Well, here's another one. If we look at cosmology, this is the theory of all, you know, and what it says is that the universe, for it to attain a state of maximum homogeny in all matter, it needs to have a uniform temperature, which means that if something has been built and it uh, gets to a maximum uh, uniform temperature, when it hits that, it starts to degrade. You see it around. Think about abandoned homes. You build this home, it's pristine. Somebody moves out because maybe they, you know, just needed to move. And they don't immediately get someone in there to continue to, to support the house and to keep the house going. That house sits there and it is, quote unquote, hit its maximum expression. So what ends up happening without continued input of energy, information, support, maintenance, whatever you want to call it, it immediately starts deteriorating. That's how a house that sits, that has housed people for 30 years, you let it 
move, let someone move out. And in six months, it needs to be condemned. You are looking at the law of entropy. Entropy is the dark that the boogeyman in the closet that is always lurking and we are needing to keep running and keep moving. So if you're in the land of apathy and you've stopped moving, you've become idle. Entropy does not take a vacation and entropy can catch up with you quickly. And so this is that siren warning call, if you will, to let you know that entropy and atrophy are afoot and they will not do because we have to get back It's uh, to this time. And you might be saying, well, Michelle, how do you know that we're about to go from zero to a thousand? Because if you think about a rubber band, okay, let me just do that. And I'm looking at my time. I got to hurry with this one. But if you look at a rubber band and you think of it as time, and you slow things down by pulling the rubber band back, right? And you keep pulling it back until it hits that point that we talked about with entropy when it it hits a maximum homogeny. What happens when you let it go? It snaps back and it snaps back fast. And that's where we are. We're about to snap back into a new expression where everything is new and people have to have new. That's why we've been really harping on learning to be able to um, uh, learn new skills, get more clarity about what you want to do and getting yourself prepared and, you know, enjoying your rest, but getting yourself prepared because it's coming. And I'm, I'm telling you now, it's coming. So I need you to understand that there is a way out of the land of apathy and you need to take advantage of it. What is your penalty or your prize? And make sure that you make it more days of the prize than the penalty. That does it for me. My time is up. I thank you for yours. I'll see you soon. And that's going to do it for today's podcast of Wisdom Smack with Michelle Spiva. If you like this podcast, please help us get the word out. Like, comment, subscribe, and even share. And if you really like it, please help us continue to get the word out by considering using this show's link for Amazon. So when you want to go to Amazon and you do all of your general shopping, Uh, please use michellespiva.com forward slash AMZ. It's simple as that. It doesn't cost you anything extra. And this show might receive a little bit of commission that will go towards helping to further get these episodes out to you and to others. So thank you so much for listening. This has been Michelle Spiva with Wisdom Smack. Bye.